Well, good afternoon. We don't want to stop any of your networking or talking because that's where you learn the most. Well, you're going to learn some, but hopefully you're going to learn some from us and some from your uh, co-workers or your partner in there. Uh, my name is Sandra Wick. I think I know most of you here in the room. Um, I am the crop production agent with the uh, Post Rock Extension District, which if you don't know, it covers five counties. Osborne is one of them, and it covers Smith, Jewell, Lincoln, and Mitchell counties. We are uh, the largest district in the state, but there are some others coming that are four counties as well. So um, just to kind of give you a heads up, we are Facebook Live. So um, um, you probably don't want to say anything that you don't want everybody to hear. No, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but anyway, um, we're trying something new today. So we've kind of got some new software. So we're going to see if this, this works too. So um, again, I'd like to thank you for coming. I know you guys were all busy. Um, trying to get some things done. Um, this is kind of new for us too because we haven't had a lot of in-person meetings for a couple years. So we're trying to do maybe some hybrid things. So we're trying to go maybe live and in-person. Uh, maybe for those people that really maybe don't feel quite comfortable to get back together as a group. So we're going to try to do that for them as well. But we wanted to also offer some in-person for you guys too. Uh, <clears throat> weed, weed management is kind of being real stressful and challenging right now. So um, that's why we wanted to give you some information and some things maybe to think about or some things that you need to be thinking about come this spring and uh, it, even into the fall. So there's several um, information over there on the table for you. There's several other meetings coming up and we'll kind of go through some of those. But uh, First of all, before I forget, your supper is provided tonight thanks to Midway Co-op. So I think we have some people in the room from Midway Co-op. I think we have a couple people. Three people? Three people. Okay. So why don't we give them a round of applause for uh, having the supper for us tonight. So if you want to, uh, Ron, uh, sometime you guys can introduce introduce them if you want. You can say a few words if you want to, kind of at one of the breaks. But we truly appreciate them because they're always true supporters of Extension for all our education. have a handout from, from Sarah Slice. So you guys can take notes on If you don't, I have a copy. Do you have that one, Kenton? No. I'm not planning on using the house. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we are very fortunate to Lancaster. She's been Case research and extension for a couple years now, so I consider that an expert, you know. So <laughs> I don't want to preface you or anything like that, Miss Sarah. But anyway, so uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, don't keep them till the end. Um, we're going to keep this very informal, so just shoot your questions as she's talking. So, Sarah, turn to you. Like Sandra said, um, I have two kids and three graduate students, I don't do anything without at least one interruption. So <laughs> it's 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 good to, to let me have your questions as we go through. We're not going to talk about hose. I have had to do that. I don't want you to have to do that either. Um, but I did hear some of the conversation before um, Sanders started the meeting, and you know, really, what kind of motivated me to put this slide set together for you guys was thinking about kind of worst case scenarios for 2022, right? And we know that we. We manage herbicide resistance in our weed populations. That reduces the effectiveness of our herbicides. Uh, we know that we are experiencing some uh, issues. Let's see if I can indicate here. Related to regulatory concerns with some of our key products. Um, we know that we have pricing and availability issues. And just over the weekend, uh, we, we see that bear is going to have trouble potentially filling some of their glyphosate orders. And so they've, they've announced that, that they've had a, a production disruption that's probably going to keep them from filling some of their orders. So, you know, 2022 is just shaping up to be the year that just keeps on giving, right? Um, in terms of these interesting and difficult situations. So a lot of the programming that I've done this winter um, has just been around kind of herbicide selection and herbicide efficacy issues, just things to think about uh, related to managing um, managing through 2022. So, you know, really we think about this, that weed management 101 stuff uh, becomes especially important, starting clean, 
applying full rates of herbicides and Jim, I would submit to you that power that glyphosate is pretty much a grass herbicide and we shouldn't be going out with the court this year. We should be going out with grass rates of, of Roundup this year, of glyphosate this year. Um, that would be the one exception I would say to that maximum mm -hmm. or that full rate rule. Um, the other thing on this slide here, thinking about increasing residual herbicide use. You guys probably all have insurance on a lot of your, your possessions, right? Why not think about residual herbicides as a little bit of an insurance against some of the, the weeds that are to come, okay? It's, it's prevention. And Tyler's talk, when she um, comes up here, will focus really on uh, residual herbicides. Other things to think about would be things like equipment maintenance and spray volume, um, using the correct adjuvants. And when our friends from the University of Nebraska come in here in a little bit, they're going to talk about some of those types of issues for you guys. Um, other things to think about um, would just be being flexible. Um, I would submit to you that farmers are among the most adaptable humans on the planet. Um, but this year, it's going to be really important when you're talking with your retailers, when you're talking with your agronomists, to make sure that you've got plan A, plan B, plan C, because... We're hearing all kinds of interesting things about supply issues, and, and you may not be able to, to get the product that is your first choice. And so be ready with what's, what's your second choice. Um, and the other item, actually the first bullet on that slide, to think about uh, maybe alternative forms to get the product that you want. So know what the active ingredient is or what the active ingredients are, and figure out alternative products that you can use to get those same active ingredients. Uh, we're going to talk a lot today about cultural and mechanical control, okay? So, you know, nothing super new, but just looking at some of the data and what it says about things like plant populations, uh, things like row spacings. We won't look at, at any data today related to crop rotation. Uh, we won't talk soil fertility. I'll leave that for uh, Dorvar to, to, to manage that uh, interesting situation for 2022. Uh, we won't look at planting date today, but I will say, I, I recognize that there are trends to start planting, particularly um, in, in places east of here, soybeans earlier, right? And there's lots of good agronomic and crop production reasons to look at that. One of the things to think about, as you move that planting date earlier, you're putting your, herb, your pre-emergence herbicides out sooner and probably farther ahead of that main flush of our, our driver weeds, like our palmer amaranth. Okay? So just making sure that we're putting on good rates and, and good products that are going to last through um, that major flush of weeds until we get good canopy closure. And then in the lines of physical or mechanical control, uh, we won't talk about cover crops today. Um, we will look at a little bit of, of information related to strategic tillage. I know that um, you know K-State and other, other agencies have put a lot, a lot of effort into reducing tillage in our cropping systems, and for good reasons. I'm not saying that no-till is bad. I'm just saying that when we think about weed management, there may be occasions, infrequent and not all of your field, where tillage might be a, a useful weed management tool, but not a hope. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about flaming um, and some of it, some of the data around that. Um, that is something, a, a non-chemical tool that is available. Uh, we'll talk about weed electrocution, um, another uh, physical weed control method that folks are starting to look at a little bit more. Um, and then we'll wrap up looking at some information about harvest weed seed control. So, you know, again, none of this is super new. But it, it is things that, you know, historically I would submit to you, I would say, for organic farmers, right? We don't, we've got herbicides, why do we need these things? Um, but as we think about managing resistance, managing through some of these supply concerns, I think it's important that we go back and we think about all of the available tools in the toolbox. Can what? I interrupt a sec? Of course. Uh, on the mechanical, the last mm -hmm. thing there, you know, I'm reading in a farm magazine to where uh, some of these uh, manufacturers are looking at that and experimenting with that right now fairly hard. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, there are a handful. There's about three different versions of those um, impact mills that can be integrated into combines. Um, Deer and, and Case, both, and other companies as well, they can be integrated. That's so, what I've read. Yeah, so we'll talk about that some more. Um, okay, so before we jump into the control practices, just a reminder that when we talk about cultural and mechanical weed control, some things to keep in mind are that you've got to know your farm and what works for you and what you're comfortable with and what your budgets permit and what your conditions allow. But you've also got to think about the weed biology and when those weeds are going to emerge um, relative to the crop. You've got to think about um, you know, how big those weeds get, things of that nature. So knowing what your weeds are um, is, is super important as we think about um, going, going forward here. All right, so I wanted to start out talking a little bit about plant spacing. Okay, and so um, basically what we're thinking about here is how can we increase the number of crop plants so that those weeds get less light um, and are, are less competitive. Okay, so these are some data. Um, they do come out of Arkansas, um, but it's, it's really the best example of how um, crops and weeds kind of interact. Okay, so what we've got going on here, we've got Palmer Am that doesn't work. We've got Palmer Amaranth. Okay, Palmer Amaranth. Um, and then it was established at different times relative to the, the crop emergence. Okay. And they were allowed to grow different distances from the crop. So within the crop row, about 10 inches from the crop, and then about 20 inches from the crop plant. Okay? And so if you look, the tallest bars here are for the Palmer amaranth plants that came up at the same time as the crop. Right? The crop was not able to outcompete um, in either of these two years where we're looking at the data. Then if you look within that emergence time, the taller bar, the most seeds were produced by the plants that were farthest from the row. So just looking at it strictly from an interaction between the crop and the weeds, the crop will keep the weeds from producing seed, right? Crops are competitive. Switching to corn, and this was a, a more complicated study that they did here I'm looking at interactions with corn plant density and cover crops, okay? And this did come from a different environment, but the point I want to make for you here is that they had three different, uh, three different locations, okay? And in two of those locations, there was a relationship between the weed um, production, the weed growth, and the corn density, but not every time, okay? So these are our good practices to use as we think about increasing the competitiveness of our crops, but not a foolproof every time we're going to see the same results um, sort of situation. It's environment dependent. What density were those? Oh. 30, 35? Ah, uh, yeah. You know what? Let me... Uh, I, I can't read it. Yeah. So 10 plants per meter squared is the high one. So that would be about a one plant per square foot. And I don't remember what that switches to it off the top of my head in terms of um, one plant per square foot. What did you say? Was it one plant per square foot? Mm -hmm. That's how they measured it. Right. Well, it's 43,560 square feet in an acre. Mm -hmm. There are, yes. So that'd be, <laughs> they didn't plant that old. That's how they, oh, I'm sorry, one plant per 10 square feet is what I said. I'm sorry, because it's a square meter there. So one plant per every 10 square feet. So that was how they did that. That's how they chose to take those measurements, okay? The point is that as they had more plants in most of those environments, they had less weed growth, but not all. The other thing that I think is interesting here, um, you know, we talked about light and dark, dark is, is good, but there wasn't necessarily a relationship between light interception and weed biomass. So it's not as simple as, as dark means no weeds. Uh, soybean density, same thing. In this particular study, they were looking, trying to tease out how glyphosate application timing interacted with soybean seeding rates. Um, they had some issues with their stands and didn't quite hit their target seeding rates 
um, for that portion of their study, but they did go back and look at the final soybean population. And again, another good example of how um, in this particular study, uh, more soybeans um, resulted in more biomass. Um, soybean row spacing is another thing that we talk about a lot, planting in those narrower rows. Um, can be advantageous for weed control. In this case, they were trying to figure out um, how row spacing affects the critical timing for weed control. So if we plant in narrower rows, does that influence when we need to keep the weeds out of the crop in order to avoid crop loss? Um, so um, looking here, the 30 inch rows, the, the dotted line, the, the seven and a half inch uh, row spacing is the solid line. So clearly um, on this graph, we see that there was greater yield loss. That dotted line is higher um, than that solid line for the seven and a half inch rows. Is moisture a variable that you brought it, into that? Yeah, so this was just one study, but you're exactly right. I can show you a data set from one of my graduate students where we had four different locations, and there's definitely an interaction with what moisture. What population did they test that at? <laughs> because the, that's important. That is important. You are exactly right. You are exactly right. Um, they had a ver I don't remember. I can pull it up. Just a minute. I think it's here. I'm sorry. It's not. Let's look at the sorghum data. Okay. You guys are asking good questions. I'm sorry. Um, all right. So sorghum row spacing. So data here coming from a thesis. Out of Dr. Dilly's lab in Manhattan, they looked at um, different populations in this study. Uh, they pulled these populations um, because there weren't any differences among the grain sorghum populations. What did matter here was, was row spacing, but uh, what I want you to see is that row spacing did not affect weed biomass. Okay, We saw some numerical differences. Um, I would argue that if we were looking at contributions to the soil seed bank that we would see some some meaningful differences in terms of how hard it's going to be to manage those weeds next year um, but there were no statistical differences among that weed biomass well no what you had between haze and boy so was rainfall um, i'm sorry you got the difference between boy yeah and that's a big difference right there was just a, a lower weed density in general to begin with at boy that was the difference there Yep. Uh, row spacing, they did see a difference. And again, I'm thinking about those environmental effects and how that plays into row spacing. Okay, you can see the same trend there with the 30 inch rows having the lowest yield um, at all three of those locations. All right. The question on that last one. Yeah. Were the populations kept the same between each one, and, and where did they plant the plant the spacing? One or thing. Did they grow them to get that? One thing that they did in this study. So they had they had the, the three different row spacings, and they also had different populations within each of those row spacings. So the, the population within the row turned out to be not important for the the differences. The row spacing was more important than the population overall. Uh, one thing they did that kind of made me raise my eyebrows here is they had uh, some of the row spacings were planted and some were drilled. Um, so that's not necessarily an apples to apple comparison there in my opinion. Tillage. So strategic tillage is something that is gaining a little bit of attention in terms of tools that can be used to manage some of our most troublesome weeds. Okay, so we're going to talk about pigweeds and we're going to talk about a couple of grasses. Okay, so pigweeds first. Um, one of the reasons that strategic tillage can work for small seeded plants like pigweeds is because when we bury those seeds, um, the, the data shows that most uh, Palmer amaranth seeds are not going to germinate from deeper than about two inches, which is five centimeters here. And the, the data also says that most Palmer amaranth seed is only going to live in the soil about three years. Okay? So if we can bury those seeds deeper than two inches, 
and do a good job with weed control for three to five years, we can theoretically uh, make some progress in terms of, of Palmer amaranth control. Um, so the things to look at in terms of this figure, they had four different tillage systems, deep tillage, conventional tillage, minimum tillage, and no tillage. Um, and the, the width of those different colored bars is um, related to the percentage of the seeds that was at that depth. Okay, so the surface would be at the top, and they went down to about 10 inches. So in these less disturbed systems, we still had most of our pigweed seed at the top where it's likely to germinate. When they plowed it, when they flipped it, they moved all those pig, the majority of those pigweed seeds to depths where they wouldn't germinate. Okay. They also looked at interactions of these tillage systems with different herbicide systems. Okay. Um, so the top four bars are a post-emergence only system. The bottom four bars um, included a residual herbicide. Okay. And so this is just more, more evidence here looking at how important those residual herbicides are um, even, you know, pretty far into the system are six soybeans, right? That's not quite starting to, to senesce yet, but that's, that's a well into the, the growing season. Okay. This is a really interesting study. Um, so Augustine <coughs> O'Moore is the soil scientist at Hayes. Okay. Augustine um, was managing a long-term... Uh, rotation and tillage study. Okay, so they had wheat fallow phases in the rotation, they had a wheat sorghum fallow, and then a continuous wheat rotation. They had no till and reduced till, okay, is what they started with. They were about to lose that study to windmill grass, okay. So one of the things they did to try to manage the windmill grass was they went in with what they're calling strategic tillage. It was basically two passes with a sweet plow. One at a more shallow depth and one at a deeper depth. Um, they were both done in late summer, like July, August time frame. Okay. So they went out a month after the tillage event and they counted weeds. Okay. And so the things I want you to see here is that in each of those phases of the rotation, the, the no-till system still had more weeds. The strategic tillage had the same number of weeds as the reduced tillage system. Okay, So with that one, one pass or one event, one year of tillage, they were able to reduce the population of, of windmill grass. They had some three-on in there as well and they had some kosha. Um, so they just counted it all together. They didn't separate out what was what. Now, I'm not gonna talk about the soil fertility data because I'm not a soil fertility or a soil health person, okay? Expert. But they took all of those measurements and saw very few differences between the no-till plots and the strategic tillage plots. That one event of tillage did not have negative consequences on all of those soil properties they were trying to manage with the no-till system. This, was a, this is an interesting study. It has, has some good implications, um, I think, for trying to get a hold of, get, get ahead of uh, windmill grass in some parts. Now these data are coming from Nebraska, okay? So this is another long-term um, tillage study. So they had no-till, strip-till, and conventional till. And they were struggling with downy brome. So we had tumble windmill grass, which is a perennial grass, has real small, shallow rhizomes, and we were trying to manage that with a sweet plow. Um, this is downy brome, so an annual grass, and they were using plowing. They were, they were inverting. They were turning it over. Okay. And what I want you to see on this is that even up to five years after that plowing event, they were still seeing differences in the density of the brome in those plots that had been plowed relative to plots that had not been plowed, whether they were in the no-till or the strip-till system. Okay, five years out. All right. 
So flame weeding. So I recently hired a new assistant scientist. I'm really excited. This is going to make my life better and make my work uh, much more efficient. Chris has been cleaning some things out. Uh, one of the things that he found, you guys can't read this, but the date on this publication is 1965. Okay? Flame weeding is not something new. It's something that, as herbicides were developed, it shifted to primarily use in organic systems. Uh, things to think about related to flea weeding, how effective it is is going to depend on speed, um, the rate of fuel use, how, how, how intense is your flame, um, what weed species you're going after. If you're going after weed species that are more succulent, it's not going to be as effective. And if you're going after grasses in general, it's not going to be as effective. Um, and then also weed size and maturity. As those weeds start to get larger, they're more difficult to control, just like with anything else, okay? Um, one of the reasons, one of the things that sort of piqued my interest on this is that we're part of a multi-state study looking at electrocution, weed electrocution. And we're also looking at other non-chemical uh, control methods as part of that study. And one of the things that has come up in a lot of the farmer conversations that I've had is, well, why aren't you looking at flame weeding as a, a comparison to electrocution? We know a little bit about it. It would be a good, a good uh, comparison. So um, we'll talk a little bit about some. There's not a lot of data on flame weeding. Okay. Can I ask a question? Of course. Please. Um, so on the uh, electrocution and the flame weeding, uh, we're talking primarily in soybeans, I'm assuming. So, a lot of this was done in grain sorghum. The electrocution um, and the study that I'm speaking of, yes, is in soybeans. Okay, so now, um, <coughs> so the, to me, the trend in, in soybeans is 50 inch rows. You're going to have to have pretty small tires to get down 50 inch rows, not very practical. So, you know, it's interesting. A lot of folks are going to 15-inch rows, but as you talk to folks, not everyone is going to 15-inch rows. Um, <coughs> you know what? We are looking at different tools that are available. I'm not saying that you need to switch from 15-inch rows to 30-inch rows, um, but this is, is an option. Not going to do that. Uh, but now, in order to do the flaming or electrocution, uh, the weeds are going to have to be above the beam. That is correct. When we get to that, we'll talk about the fact that you have to have a height differential between the soybeans and the weeds. Yep. And so by that time, uh, the weeds are already pretty big. Yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. They are because these tools are primarily, the electrocution in particular, is primarily intended to manage escapes. No, escapes. Escapes, yeah. Yes. The uh, flame, uh, as far as this is concerned, mm -hmm. is it like a hooded in row burner or is it like a broadcast? So we're going to look at some data from a couple of different situations. Um, some of them are, are targeting between row and some of them actually are trying to target within the row um, and, and getting some injury to the, to the crop as they do that. So I was actually about ready to ask, has anybody burned their field down doing that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's a good point. Yeah. It is, I mean, again, it, not it, for everybody. Yeah, yeah, not sound for effective, everybody. but now. too effective, huh? How much are we getting rid of? <laughs> so, if you've got small weeds, you can control them. Um, if you're looking at grasses, not going to get good control of grasses. Um, you are going to see some crop injury. Um, in wheat, that crop injury is associated to the growth stage of the crop. So the smaller the wheat, I'm sorry, the larger the wheat, the more yield loss they saw. Um, with the electrocution, uh, this is something that, again, a lot of folks are, are kind of interested in looking at. It's my understanding that there are some units like this that are actually in use on production fields out west, specifically to try to manage some of the pigweed escapes. So what kind of voltage are we talking about there? <laughs> you know, that's a good question. It's something along the order, I think, of 80,000, I believe is the number. Um, what's the, the number? Mm -hmm. So that's generated how? 
with this uh, machine here on the back of the tractor. Power takeoff, yeah. Power takeoff, yeah. Yes, it is. There's about, there are two companies in the U.S. that are making these um, tools, and there are about three out of Europe that are making them. Mm -hmm. yep. And you said 80,000 volts? I think that's the number. I would have to double check that before I would. In comparison, uh, Power lines running out in the country at the farmstead. Do mm -hmm. you guys know how many volts is on those? I don't know. A lot of your around town, I would say here, used to be, I so it still is, around 7,200. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, so that's I'm sorry, 8,000. Right I'm sorry, 8,000. That's, that's mm -hmm. better. It's a high load. It's not, it's, it's, Got some safety concerns. Um, you know, anybody that has been working on this will tell you that that is among the greatest concerns they have. There are also concerns because it does arc and has sparks. Well, at that moment, you'd expect that. Yep, <laughs> you would. So, uh, what we know here is that as the plants get larger, they have better uh, weed control. And we do know that. Um, if you don't have enough of that height difference between the, the soybeans and the um, you can get some crop injury, and that is associated with some yield reductions. All right, harvest weed seed control. Um, there are three different things we can think about in this category. Um, number one there would be chaff lining, and so the thinking there is that, well, there's a couple of things going on. Number one, you're putting all of your weeds in one place. Um, so theoretically, they're easier to control. Um, and, and the thinking would be that that chaff line is creating an environment that is going to increase the degradation rate, the break, the, the um, predation and degradation of those seeds, so you won't have as many seeds that are viable to germinate. Um, a second option is windrow burning, so y'all were concerned about the, the flaming. Uh, another um, option. And then the one I wanted to actually visit with you guys a little about, bit about, just in terms of, you know, thinking differently, thinking about what does this look like in the future when the, when the companies aren't coming up with more chemistry, um, is thinking about impact mills. And so initially, primarily, uh, their primary, their first development, like I said, in Australia was for ryegrass control and wheat, okay? Ryegrass control and wheat. Um, here in the U.S., folks are looking at them more in terms of trying to control pigweeds and soybeans. So lots of differences there. One of which um, is that we lose a lot of our pigweeds to shattering ahead of the combine. Okay? So um, losing a lot, we can lose some. Um, with the straw, because it is light, it's not all necessarily going to get directed to that impact mill. Um, and so that is, is one of the biggest um, hurdles. So you ask about cost of these machines. The prices that I've seen range from about sixty dollars to $80,000 um, to have one of these machines integrated into your common. So it is a big investment. And again, I'm not saying it's for everybody. I'm saying it's things to think about um, as we, we have to be a little creative about the future. So here you see um, the machine, the, the mill. It's a belt driven mill. Um, it's an impact mill. So one piece is turning, one piece is stationary, and it's, it's basically grinding those weed seeds so that they're no longer viable. Um, these are some data looking at effectiveness in terms of damage and what gets to the mill. A lot of it is damage, but like we said, that's probably somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of, of what's in the field is actually getting uh, back to that impact. Um, this could be an effective in some crops. Um, again, it has to go through the combine, so something that has a higher header height. Right? You're not going to get as much of that weed seed through the combine. Um, this, this group, they went out the year after they ran the seed terminator. There were no differences between um, where they 
ran the Terminator and where they did it at any of these four locations. So you're not, you're preventing additions to the weed seed bank. You're not killing any of the seeds that are already in the seed bank. So some of these locations have very high um, densities of, of water hemp. And so they, did, they weren't able to make a meaningful drop in a single season. All right, uh, you guys have weed control guides in front of you. Um, you should also have, you know, no ma sometimes no matter how many eyes you have looking at something, you do have a mistake. And so there was a word omitted from the Reviton entry in the weed guide. So you should have a little slip of paper um, to correct that to go with your book. Um, if you how want an updated, paper? you got one, Sandra? Yeah, how many need this? If you want, uh, the copy online is already updated. Um, you can take a picture of that little QR code in the corner there, and you can have a copy on your phone um, that you can use. So I will leave that slide up for a minute. And that was what I wanted to talk about this afternoon. Tyler's going to talk about residual herbicides. So um, Tyler finished her master's degree under Dallas. She looked at soybean response to off-target movement of dicamba. Um, and she is now looking at residual herbicide use in corn. Tyler, I'm not sure if your um, it's all right. things are going to work. Have them. Yeah, I think yeah, that's good. I think that's good. Because we need that. No. Oh. It just doesn't really do anything. It may not work like that. It's okay. It's up to you. All right, so like Sarah said, my name is Tyler Myers. I am a PhD student. Uh, I was just kind of dumb enough to stick around that long, so I should be done here soon. But so we're going to be talking about how you can reconsider your residual herbicides in corn. Uh, so I have a couple questions for you, maybe, if it'll let me do that. Okay, I will just ask you guys. So, do you re utilize residual herbicides in your corn? Yes. All right. Someone brave enough to answer? So, I can, I do TA sometimes with undergrad, so I can just stare at you guys until you answer me. So, when do you apply your residual herbicides? All the above. Yeah. So I kind of expected some of those answers. Okay, now I think I can put it back into regular. All right, so why are our, our residual herbicides so critical? Uh, they're really critical right now when we think about our increased presence of those herbicide resistant weeds and we really don't wanna ever see those come out of the ground. And that kind of illustrates my last point here. Oh. My last point here, the best time to control a weed is before it even comes up. And that, that allows us to reduce our selection pressure on our post-emergence herbicides, which many of those herbicide-resistant weeds, like especially palm ramrant, are post-emergence herbicides. And then in addition to that, we have to think about our availability of a lot of our compounds, like Roundup, 2,4-D, and so we have to put a lot of increased uh, reliance on these residual herbicides and so we have to kind of think about how we can optimize those applications. And we're going to talk about a few different things, uh, like our sprayer parameters, as well as our um, how we can tailor our herbicide selection to our upcoming forecast. application that we apply in season because we want to make sure that it's actually the corn getting it and not the weeds especially with as expensive as fertilizer is right now 
And in general, it's just really critical to start clean and to use those residual herbicides uh, because it's kind of been shown that corn can, as soon as three days after the corn emerges, it can sense a uh, presence of weeds and it can start to reallocate its resources. And a lot of times, like I said, that first response is to growing taller. And another thing we want to think about is we need to get out there as early as possible when we're controlling these weeds because there's been some data just over in Colorado where they looked at uh, every day that you delay weed control, you can see up to 2% yield loss per day. And so it's just really important to be controlling those weeds. And then again, that's kind of an environmental impact, but that's kind of a good number to go by because it just shows how important it is to be controlling those weeds as soon as possible. <coughs> So I'm kind of going to switch gears and talk about some grassy weeds in corn. Uh, so in general, we should be controlling these prior to V6 or V8 um, or before those weeds reach four inches. So really, four inches applies to most uh, of our weeds. So that's when those post-emergent herbicides start to lose efficacy once those weeds uh, get past four inches. And this kind of can help us reduce the risk of yield loss and reduce our risk of nitrogen <coughs> loss. And so in the off chance, or in the chance that you have like some a weed control failure, there's been some studies showing that you can use high rates of nitrogen to offset some of those impacts. If you have water. If you have water, but I don't know if that's anything that anybody's actually doing uh, in a practical sense, just because that's expensive to do that, right? And so, and there's some environmental consequences that go with that. I wanna talk about a few uh, weed species here in Kansas. So shatter cane. Uh, so there's been some research showing that shatter cane can cause up to 80% yield loss when it's allowed to compete season long in drier years. So I think in that study they received about 19 inches of rain. Uh, so that's a pretty dry year. I mean, that's pretty typical of Western Kansas though. Um, and then under uh, more optimal conditions, about 30 inches of rain, they saw about 40% yield loss when shatter cane was allowed to compete season long. But they can kind of mitigate some of that, shatter, that yield loss when they have controlled shatter cane prior to 12 inches. And something else with this study, they found that when it was allowed to comp every day and delay, with every day you delayed your shatter cane control, you could lose almost 1% yield loss. And then I'll talk about some yellow fox cell. There wasn't a lot out there about yellow fox cell, surprisingly. Um, but what I could find was a model looking at biomass versus yield and with models, it's really uh, what model is less wrong. So kind of take this with a little bit of grain of salt. So it's, it's estimated 10% yield loss whenever there was 0.05 pounds of biomass per square foot. So that's really not a lot. And then we, by proxy, we can talk about giant foxtail. So control prior to V5 or prior to the weed reaching nine inches, which we should be controlling the weeds prior before they reach nine inches. Um, it resulted in minimum yield loss, and they saw that season-long competition resulted in about 18% yield loss. Some of that could be attributed to um, environmental conditions or other conditions as well. And then sandbur. Uh, so sandbur can, if you control it before it's interfered for four weeks, uh, you can really reduce your risk, reduce your risk of yield loss. Um, and with that, it caused about 40% yield loss when allowed to compete season-long. So, obviously, I cannot give a weed science presentation and not talk about Palmer amaranth. Uh, so I'm going to go into a couple of things, reasons why I think it's a competitive weed. Um, so it has a really complex genome. And so with that, any random mutation, like what we're seeing with our resistant populations, you can uh, reduce your efficacy of your herbicides. And oftentimes they're resistant to multiple mode of actions and sometimes it can be resistant to herbicide groups that it's never even been exposed to. Uh, I want to like kind of highlight, you know, last year they identified a six-way resistant Palmer amaranth population around Manhattan, and it's actually uh, thought to be resistant to seven different groups of herbicides. So that field that was found in was destroyed. I mean, it, it, it's just every time a weed comes up, someone goes out there and pulls it, make sure that we're not putting that back into the weed seed bank. <laughs> And then on top of that, the biology itself really contributes to its competitiveness. So it um, is native to the southwestern U.S., so like Arizona, New Mexico, and from the desert. 
And so it's a really adaptable plant. Anytime there's any moisture or any uh, nutrients, it's able to um, really capitalize on that. And so that makes it, when it, you put it into a really prolific type system or an optimal system like we do for our crops, it, it just thrives. Um, and on top of that, it's also a prolific seed producer. It can produce up to 600,000 seeds per plant. And when you pair that with a complex genome, you can have a lot of variability, even in just one field and in just one plant. And so that can make it harder to control some of your weeds as well. And then it's really competitive at low densities because it's a really robust plant. You know, we see those Christmas tree sized palm amaranth. So in this picture here, uh, there's actually a cotton crop in there. Um, that was one of my trials this summer in Hutchinson and, or Pat last summer, and there's approximately like 100 to 200 palm amaranth per like square foot. <laughs> so just shows you how competitive it can be. And a lot of that cotton never even set bowls. So in general, palmer amaranth in corn is really competitive. So it can cause 11 to 91% yield loss when, a, when it's allowed to emerge with the corn as densities increase from 0 0.15 to 2.4 plants per foot of row. And then when it's allowed, when it merges later, like between B4 and B7, it causes 7 to 35% yield loss. While not as severe, it still causes significant yield loss. And it can significantly reduce or change the way that corn uses water and nitrogen. So why should we care about uh, herbicide resistant weeds? So obviously we're gonna have reduced weed control light, right, if we can't get good control of them. And that ultimately results in reduced crop production. And when we try to get, regain control of those weeds, we're gonna see increased herbicide costs, especially when we think about uh, the current costs and the current supply issues of our common post herbicides. And then that results in an increased weed seed bank, which that's gonna lead us to have many years of increased production costs. And we're gonna have to be really strategic about our um, weed control programs. So a, I think in 2016, there was a survey, I think by the w, WSSA or Weed Science Society of America. And in Canada and Amer in the United States, they estimated that farmers were losing approximately $43 billion a year to um, herbicide resistant weeds. So they have a huge impact on, really on farmers in general. So we kind of want to look at um, how we could kind of offset some of the maybe economic issues. Um, and so we want to look at the effect of spray volume on weed control and corn. So there are several applicator, uh, or ap several parameters that are controlled by the applicator. And this is just very generalized. I know there's a much, much more. <laughs> but so speed, spray volume, spray nozzle, type and size, spray pressure, boom height, and sprayer setup. And which sprayer setup encompasses a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, I'll have to get out of that again. So do you change application parameters to increase your spray efficiency? Yeah, so retailers, uh, custom applicators, 100% going to do that. I don't think we see it as much with um, a private applicator that's doing their own stuff. I don't know. I feel like you guys have some ideas. We hope so. Yeah. So... See, we'll go to the next one. So there's several parameters that impact efficiency, uh, travel speed, boom width, tank size, spray volume, your field length, number of headlands, your turning speed, and your fill time. And really a lot, all of these come together in a whole mess of formulas and equations to develop, to get your net productivity or your field efficiency. So this is an app. Um, they can get access to it online. It's by Sprayers 101, and you can just like Google Sprayer Productivity Calculator. And you can put in all of your um, different parameters, and it'll give you your net productivity in acres per hour. And then it'll break down where you're losing your most time based on what you put in. <coughs> so obviously, there's going to be a lot of other conditions that go in there to that you're. Um, yeah, so the app, it's not, you can't put it on your phone, unfortunately, because like when your phone updates, it causes issues with the app, but I can, 
find the link and give it to you guys if you want. But anyways, if you go to calculation details too, it'll break it down even further. <laughs> but it's a really interesting thing, and like I said, there's a whole bunch of math behind it, and it's really not that hard. I, if I can do it, anybody can do it. I'm not that great at math. But it's just a good thing to like maybe sit down early on in the season before you start spraying and look at this. Okay, Tyler, I have a quick question. So that's an app for your computer then? Yeah, so you can okay. just, um, I have it bookmarked on my, okay. on the internet, so. So, so will it work on a tablet then? Or yeah, just yeah you can use it on your phone. Like you can just oh, go okay. on Safari or whatever you have on your phone and get to it. Okay. And then, it, yeah, it's by Sprayers 101. So we also did send out a Kansas applicator survey where um, we wanted to evaluate herbicide application practices throughout the state and how we could allocate our extension resources to better help uh, our applicators. So we had about 206 respondents across the state and the survey data was collected for spray volume for burn down applications, pre-emergence applications, and post-emergence applications. And in general, we found that Lower volumes were utilized in western Kansas than in other states, or other parts of the state. Um, I'm sure there's several factors that go into that. Does anybody have any input on that? Or they'd like to? In you have to get a mile. You've got a field three miles long. You can't get enough water to get up and back. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was kind of one of my thoughts was maybe field size, types of herbicides that are being used. So carryover from glyphosate when it was first introduced that killed yep. everything and now we're still living with it. It's very gallon of acre, isn't it? <laughs> um, See, so yeah, I was just being born in the era of when glyphosate first came out, so. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot more systemic herbicides being used in western Kansas, whereas in, you know, getting more central Kansas and eastern Kansas, you're going to, you can be able to get away with uh, those contact herbicides like Liberty and Cobra. And so that need, you know, a lot more humidity to actually be effective. So we came up with a couple objectives. The first is to quantify the effects of residual herbicides on weed control when the number of applications and spray volume changed. And then the subsequent effects it had on sprayer efficiency and the economics. So I haven't done the sprayer efficiency and economics uh, analysis yet, but that will be coming soon. Is most of those sprays need rain activated? So, um, we'll talk about that, but a couple of them have some like residual herbicides <coughs> that don't need as much water. Um, that was kind of our thought process when we picked them, is just they don't need as much water. Um, so, I'm from southeastern Colorado, so I understand dry. Um, dry land and I understand how dry it can be and so I have a kind of like a little love for western Kansas and so I, that was kind of our um, idea behind some of these tank mixes. So we use three different spray volumes, uh, six gallons per acre, 13 gallons per acre, and 20 gallons per acre. Um, I would have went down to five but gallons per acre but it just the pattern wasn't right with our spray equipment and I didn't I didn't want to be spraying with bad pattern. Would uh, airplanes more than six gallon? I think sometimes they go as low as like two and a half. So I think that might be a little high for an airplane. Um, and then the number of applications. So we did early post-emergence at V2, or the one the corn was V2, and we applied that alone. And, or we did the early post followed by a late post that was applied when the corn was V8. So we had a couple different tank mixes. So the first one we did was two and a half quarts of Resicor, which is Warrant and Stinger or Clopyrrolid and um, Mesotrion or Callisto. And then we followed, that was tank mixed with Roundup, Atrazine, Crop Oil, and AMS. And then we also used 15 fluid ounces of BCS 720. So that's currently an experimental herbicide that should be released this year. It's a tank mix of Balance, Varo, which is thion carbazone, and uh, Flufenicet. So Flufenicet's a group 15 herbicide, and it's in the same family of herbicides as like Dual, and Zidua, and Outlook. Um, but the reason why they chose Flufenicet is it supposedly has a little bit longer length of residual due to differences in its chemistry. 
And I think, if I'm thinking right, so that's basically Fufenicet plus Corvus. And then that was tank mixed with the same things. And then the late post was status and Roundup and AMS, and that was applied at 15 gallons per acre. So, okay. 10 ounces of status? We have the same. So, okay, what are you spraying it on? Is this corn? Or yes, is it, corn. What kind of crop did you have? Well, I mean, we sprayed it before the cutoff at V8. <laughs> Still, that thing's going to be leaning. Or you're going to be broke. I mean, we already have bad yields because of the, um... That's $30 an acre. That's an extremely high rate. That is high. Because isn't two ounces of status equal to like six ounces of clarity? I can't off the top of my head. Five ounces is the normal rate. Yeah. yeah. Then I think it's like six ounces. So, so this came out the recommendation of our bear rep, actually, so that's why, but, um, <laughs> but that's what you use. Yes, anyway, so the BCS 720 actually caused a crop response in Colby due to high soil pH, and that was just the balance component mixed with the crop oil, mm -hmm. um, but there wasn't any yield impacts. So there's some huge differences in rainfall, obviously, but um, it really shows the differences in weed control we're going to see. So in Ottawa, we received about 15 inches of rain just after planting. Uh, so we had really poor stands, and we had so. But by the time it re dried out enough to replant, it was a little late, and so I just rolled with it and just took weed control ratings. Um, and then Colby, so I didn't apply the late post in Colby just because the weed pressure didn't warrant it. Uh, it was really good weed control from the early post application. So the water hemp control in um, autos, when it had the late post, it was okay. Uh, but at the early post alone, it was, as the season went on, it just got almost where it was unacceptable. Um, but you really couldn't see much differences between the herbicides uh, the early post herbicide tank mixes, other than when it was applied at the lowest uh, spray volume. Uh, and I kind of attribute that to some of the differences in rainfall, or the rainfall and the, so the fulfenicet component of the BCS 720 is less water soluble than the acetochlor component of the Resicor. So when we had that large amount of rainfall, uh, that resulted in that Resicor, or that acetochlor moving out of that weed seed zone and just not being being diluted and not being as active in the soil. Whereas that flufenicet, since it has is more is less water soluble, it had a longer length of residual. So this is just the water hemp control at harvest. Um, so again, kind of the same story. They only really only see the differences at the six gallons per acre, but it really shows you the importance of adding that late post application. Uh, where even though the control's not great, you still clean up some of those weeds. And it's really the same story for the fall panicum control. Again, at the six gallons per acre, you see a clear difference between the two herbicides where the BCS 720 just had higher levels of control. Um, res the Resicor performed better at the 20 gallons per acre. And I, I really can't explain this interaction. Uh, this kind of just shows us that we need to do some more trials. And, but when you add the late post, uh, it really increases your control. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, so um, where I'm at, uh, I noticed fall panicum, you know, later in the season, I don't, I don't see it. Uh, and of course that's a grass. Um, in corn, what, we've used in the past is the status and the roundup as second application. We use the pre-emerge or basically was sprayed right about the time of the plant, or just right after. So it hadn't come up. Crop hadn't come up. Uh, and I've often thought about adding a residual um, grass type herbicide that would be good for the fall panicum 
such as acetylcholine or S. I can't pronounce that word. Help me out here. S. Metolachlor. Metolachlor, yeah. Or maybe Zuja, but Zuja is not as water soluble as the other two. No. Um, you get that fall panic of light. Because, because the, uh, you know, even if you've got residual on the status, it's not going to do anything. No, yeah, so the dicamba component of the status, it doesn't give you very long length of residual, so about one rain's worth, if that. Um, but, yeah, you're exactly right with those group 15s. They're fairly effective on small seeded uh, grasses and broadleaves like uh, fall panicum and the pigweeds. So, and kind of the follow-up to that, and this is a lot of the topic that other guys might be interested in this too, uh, between your acetochlor, your s metolachlor your Zuja, which of those really are the most effective against uh, late germinating pigweeds? So, I mean, it depends on the environment that you're in. So, you know, Zidua, if you can get it activated, it's going to give you a pretty long length of residual. Um, but if you don't get a lot of rain, something like acetochlor might be better. Um, well, say so, yeah, cedar core. From what I understand, you can't, you shouldn't apply it to corn that's over eleven inches. And the metola core is about the same thing. Now, if you go with warrant, from what I read in the uh, twenty-one K state book, it can be applied up to thirty inches, which would probably be around a V eight or something like that. Thoughts, comments. So yeah, warrant is the same thing as a cedar core. Yeah, but it's got um, some other stuff in it. It's just encapsulated. <laughs> so, which basically helps it stay longer in the soil, and you get a longer length of residual. But you need a little bit more water than, uh, like, harness, which, right, is under. No, never mind. You need a little bit more water to get that encapsulated <coughs> uh, formulation activated, though. But it does provide you a little bit longer residual than the unencapsulated. Well, in any case, you can apply to bigger corn, too. Mm -hmm. So... But so this is my non-treated control in Ottawa about 125 days after planting. So uh, it was pretty bad, to say the least. So, so that had zero herbicide. Unit. Zero, yeah, that was just from the beginning. Um, Ottawa is a, is a great place to do some weed science research. But so I'm just going to I'm going to show you some pictures. Just so this is the reservoir on the left is the reservoir applied at the 20 gallons per acre without a late post, so it's really not that much different than that non-treated control. Uh, and then it's this is the reservoir followed by a late post application, just illustrating how important those later season applications are to help just clean up those escaped weeds or those weeds that your um, earlier season application didn't get. And this is a BCS 720. Uh, at six gallons per acre uh, as an early post only on the left, and then on the right, it's the BCS 720 followed by the late post. And there are a lot, a lot of differences, but it just cleaned up a little bit more. Um, again, like the weed control is not great, but considering what that non treated control looks like, I think this book's pretty good. Again, we didn't take this corn to yield just because the stands are so variable. It ranged from like 7,000 to 21,000 plants per acre. So it's just, like I said, by the time it dried out enough for me to, for us to replant, it was almost halfway through June. So I was just gonna write weed control anyways. Hopefully next year is better, or this summer is better. Um, so this is the reservoir applied at six gallons per acre on the left. Uh, and then on the right, it's the BCS 720 applied at six gallons per acre. So almost night and day difference between the two herbicides. So this is our Palmer amaranth control. Um, Palmer was the dominant weed species in Colby. Uh, and it ranged, the control ranged between 92 and 95% control all season long. Uh, so at harvest, we had about 95% control. And our weeds were small and kind of weak, but... That doesn't mean that they don't go to seed and produce viable seeds. So there's some research out of Arkansas looking at Palmer amaranth biomass versus seed production and viable seed production. And so even with those really small plants, you can still see significant amounts of 
um, seed redeposit into that weed seed bank. So while sometimes unrealistic, we almost have to adopt this zero threshold um, mentality with things like Palmer Amaranth that are really prolific seed producers, especially if we want to kind of try to eliminate that, um, not eliminate, but keep herbicide resistance at bay. Well, I can tell you from walking cornfields here that I've seen palmers that are four inches tall late in the season is going to seed that on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's kind of where that comes into play, where even these little small plants, they can still produce a significant amount of seed. And while they might not look like they're going to be contributing a lot of seed, just because they're small, since their seeds are so small, they can produce a lot. And again, that just... We need to adopt that zero threshold mentality, at least, while not always, like I said, realistic to be able to get out there and always keep it 100% clean. We need to try our best to um, implement that. <coughs> so this is just showing the Resicor at 6 gallons per acre and the BCS 720 at 6 gallons per acre in Colby. And this is about 106 days after planting. And... There's virtually no difference between those two, and this is the same uh, same treatments I showed you where there's like night and day difference between these herbicides. Um, so really good control, but regardless, if we have one little uh, palmer amaranth escape, it's still um, adding new seed, um, adding, or adding seeds back to the weed seed bank. So, and that really comes down to a, an environmental impact. So these conditions surrounding applications, they can influence how these certain residual herbicides perform and how these residual herbicides, and how they perform at specific uh, spray volumes. And that, you know, we kind of saw that um, in good conditions, like what we had in Colby, that we might be able to get away with lower spray volumes. And, but when we're looking at something a little bit more challenging, like what we saw in Ottawa, um, you might need to be more strategic about what you're utilizing. And it really uh, confirms our, well, we really need to consider our environment whenever we're selecting our herbicides. And that's where this next uh, trial comes into play. Uh, we had a lot of questions about how um, the environment impacts group 15 herbicides. So right, I mentioned group 15 herbicides are like Dual and Zidua and Warrant and Outlook, and which are the four we're going to be talking about. And then the other one I added is Fluvenicet. So... What determines the efficacy of residual herbicides? So there's a few different things, right? Our herbicide chemistry, soil characteristics, and weather. So our herbicide chemistry is how its water solubility, its adsorptivity, and its um, herbicide half-life. So the adsorptivity is just basically, or water solubility is how much water it takes for that um, herbicide to be diluted in the soil, and the adsorptivity is just how well that um, herbicide molecule adheres to the soil particles. And then as the half-life is just basically how long it takes for half of that herbicide to break down in the soil. So the first two I mentioned really predict or dictate how much is going to be available in the soil solution for plants to uptake. And specifically, the adsorptivity really dictates how long or the length of residual for most a lot of herbicides. And then we're going to talk about soil characteristics. So that includes just generally pH, texture, and organic matter. So pH really um, determines the length of residual just because of chemical breakdown and microbial degradation as well. And then texture and organic matter uh, determine how well or how, how much of that herbicide is absorbing to the soil molecules. And so that's generally why you, with a finer textured soil with higher organic matter, you can apply higher rates of residual herbicides. And then weather, of course. So temperature, uh, generally as temperature increases, we see an increase in chemical breakdown and in microbial degradation. And then rainfall. Uh, so with rainfall, obviously, we want that first initial rainfall after we apply to get it activated. And we want it to just be just enough and to get it activated, but we want too much to leach it out of that weed seed zone um, or dilute the herbicide, herbicide too much in the soil solution. But we need it, um, yeah, but we need it to be activated. So we came up with this objective to compare the environmental impact um, on efficacy of these group 15 herbicides that I mentioned 
and we apply, when applied at various simulated corn planting times and how they affect weed control. So we applied dual, outlook, warrant, and zidua, and those are the high rates because we were applying it to a silty loam with 3% organic matter. And all of those herbicides were applied at April 14th, April 29th, May 14th, June 4th, and June 18th. To kind of um, account for different plant corn planting dates in Kansas and when these herbicides might be applied throughout the season. So we collected um, soil temperature, soil moisture, air temperature, and rainfall, as well as weekly weed control estimates and weekly palm ram ram height. So um, this is just a just showing us palm ramaranth control over after days after application. So early on, there are some missing palm ramaranth data points, just especially with the April fourteenth application. Just is cool and wet early on in the season, and so there really wasn't anything growing. And so those initial um, those initial control um, visual control ratings are missing. But in general, these herbicides kind of perform the same. Um, there wasn't, except for at the May 14th application where after May 14th received about four inches of rain. And so the acetochlor or the warrant just didn't perform as well as those other herbicides. So acetochlor does have a higher water or lower water sol solubility than those other herbicides, but its absorptivity is different. And so it doesn't, it doesn't absorb to those soil molecules quite as well as those other herbicides. So and that's really what explains those differences at the May 14th application date. So this is just to show you the um, rainfall that we received. So that's the rain, about three inches of rain that we received after that May 14th application. And I thought this was interesting. So this is just Palmer Amaranth control versus the rainfall you received seven days after application. So there's a lot of data out there showing that your the amount of rainfall you receive in the first two weeks after your application is critical just because that dictates um, your, your later season control because it's either your um, once you go past the 14 days you aren't necessarily going to get your herbicide activated so especially this first seven days is super critical so we found that um, as rainfall increased as the amount of rainfall received seven days after application increased uh, acetochlor, the control of acetochlor declined rapidly, but with other herbicides that are like that had the um, less water soluble or had absorbed, uh, had a greater absorption coefficient, uh, if they didn't receive enough rainfall in that first seven days, control declined. But as that rainfall increased, uh, you kind of saw a rapid incline in control, especially for the outlook, where the other ones stayed kind of. Um, fairly level, but you can see a little bit of decline for all of them. So those colors up there, so Zidua and Dual are the two that work? Is that what they're... You're yeah, pretty about? much. So they really were the least sensitive to um, the residual herb or the amount of rainfall, but you can still see they still had, you know, as when we received less than half an inch of rain in that first seven days, you still saw a decline in control. But as that rainfall increased, it kind of leveled out or if increased. But um, that the outlook, uh, I thought that was interesting how much it declined with a uh, very little rainfall. But the and then the warrant, as soon as we got to about one inch of rain, it's de it's uh, controlled Palmer amaranth declined rapidly. So based upon the charts, that chart there, and then the chart ahead, well maybe. This one here. Yeah, I can go ahead and move to that. Um, so, what would be the best herbicide in your opinion? Well, it depends on your environment. So, like, what's your opinion? Well, I know that's, that's this environment that you study. That's what we're yeah. asking. <laughs> well, it's going to depend on this I'm, year, too. Huh? On what? It'll depend on the weather this year, too. So, on that this, was kind of this study. This study. I know you get in trouble if you recommend different companies, but this study, what's your opinion work best with this environment? That's what I'm trying to find out. Well, when you're getting up, when you're getting high levels of rain in the forecast, or you have high levels of rain, warrant probably won't be your best option. 
because uh, it's just not going to be available for those plants, those weeds to take up. And so you're going to not necessarily result in weed control failure, but you're not going to get the most effective control out of it. So with this, we were looking at days for Palmer amaranth to reach four inches. So four inches is critical, right? We want to try to target those weeds. Because once they reach four inches, you're not getting as much control. And this was kind of an interesting uh, data set to look at. So for the April 14th and April 29th application, those, those weeds generally grew slower, right? It's cooler. And they're not getting as much sunlight. Uh, and But when we got to May 14th and days started to heat up and we got a lot of rain, uh, the Palmer amaranth growth rate really increased. But those herbicides, even the more... Um, um, even the warrant really slowed down that Palmer amaranth. And so giving you a little bit more time to get out there and control it. And well, then the... Well, based on the May 14th, it looks like the outlook is the best. Yeah. Yes. So, but I'm just trying to illustrate that when you include those um, residual herbicides, it slows down or it gives you more time to get out there and control those Palmer amaranth uh, because they grow... Or they're, it takes them more time to get out of the ground and they're just a little bit slower in general. So, okay, so let me understand what you did. So um, you applied the residual herbicide, and let's say on the May 14th, and at that point you didn't apply anything else with it. No, so this study is specifically looking how the environment impacts those individual herbicides. We're not looking at tank mixes, we're just looking at how... Okay. And then the... Control the, with those individual herbicides. I know that's not realistic. That's not what people are doing, right? right. But we want to understand how we can tailor our residual herbicides to the environment. Right. And to the future forecast. Now, on the June 4th, uh, you would be uh, a little later. Yes. So and, that... Uh, about three weeks later or so. And uh, so, obviously, the soil is going to be warmer. And then the June 18th, or whatever it was, 16th, 18th, and again, the soil's warmer. Yeah, so... And those plants, the, the ground was clean when you applied the herbicide. Yes, so I tilled it, or we dissed it before we applied the herbicide to make sure it's clean. Since we're not going any within, in with anything else, we needed to be clean. So if I'm looking at those right, Zidua is the best and Doodle's next in all the situations, pretty much. Well, yeah, so... Close to it. Yeah. So Zidua tended to perform better in this trial, and it could be varied between lo among locations. So technically, you proved that a good residual works. It does, yeah. So and then tank mix it with other things to control the other. Basically, so what that's, the this is just the proof of the study. What, what I want you guys to, so many questions. Yeah. I want to get a handle on it. What yeah. I want you guys to get from this is including a residual, kind of regardless of the time of year, it gives you more time later on to get out there to control them. So, with that, we concluded that a uh, warrant might not be the best option if you have high amounts of rainfall in your forecast. You might choose something that's less, has a, a can absorb at a, has higher absorptivity, um, but so like <coughs> Zidua or a Zidua, Zidua or um, Outlook or um, Dual. And duels actually yes, the total for in there. Yes. Could you back up? You had the rates listed. I think it goes in in here. Um, it should be on the slide prior yeah. to. Yeah. Right here. Slide. Oh, there it is. 30. Two points, 21. Okay. okay. So, I'm sorry. so yeah, just a reminder. We did apply this to a silty loam that has 3% organic matter. Mm -hmm. So how do the prices of these compare? <laughs> you mean last year? <laughs> so, so I, we really, we were just looking at how these, um, the environment impacts these herbicides. And I understand I use the name brand ones, right? We get those for free, so. Uh, why not use them? 
but so I'm not really sure about the prices right now. Um, the weed control guide does have a page in the front with the different herbicide prices. And, and it's good. usually cheaper to get Zidua, for example, mixed with something else okay. than it is to buy straight Zidua. See, and that kind of so goes along with what Sarah talks about how you might need to <coughs> sort of get a premix to get the herbicide that you want. You also look at the basic chemical companies uh, rebate programs like a, a Roundup Rewards program that rewards you for multiple products, mm -hmm. then it builds up and thus the price <coughs> drops on a warrant because it's a third product in there if you're right. Plant. And so that's why they're doing that to bring the level of cost breaker to compete with their market. Okay, so I got another question. Um, so if you, and I know you didn't do this, but if you're using a pre, and the pre has a residual, um, so let's say that your pre has uh, metolachlor in it, and yet metolachlor did good in your study, so then would you want to come back? On your second application with your Roundup, maybe your status and your Metolachlor again, or would you want to switch? So yeah, I mean herbicide resistance management kind of dictates that we don't want to be using the same mode of actions over and over again. So we need yeah, to be. Yeah, see the site's the same, but the chemi the chemicals different. Because see, all of those have the same site of action. All group fifteen. Yes. They're all group fifteen, but the chemi but the chemicals different. Yes, but um, since they're same and they're since they're in the same herbicide family, they act the same in the plant. And so a lot of times, even though they might be resistant to one of those herbicides in that family, they can they can be resistant maybe or have a, you can have decreased efficacy with those other other um, herbicides in that family. And so if you have resistance, so you need to just rotate your mode of action group. So go to a different. Uh, Herbicide. I, I think maybe the question he's asking, if you put the you put the dual on, you plant, two weeks later you're hitting it with a poster three, the half-life of the dual, the dual's half gone by then. I, I, I understood the question was, should he heat that dual back up a little bit right then at that two or three week time? With, with another? Well, no, with dual, because you have, it's already half gone, what you put on earlier. Yeah. It's probably outside late. We did that with priests for mile and corn. You put two thirds shot on. But, but I'm talking about put the same full product. Rate, full rate on. Well, then you can't put more on. Yeah. You don't put so much on here. But you can mix them like dual and zidua because zidua takes more rainfall to incorporate. So if it's dry, the dual incorporates. When you get more rain, it'll activate later and stretch that out. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. I mean, split applications are recommended, but you can't use the full rate both times. Um, so like he said, you can use two-thirds up front or half up front and then come in with your second half later on. Well, or then, what I was asking is you, you just simply change chemicals, but see, you're in the same family. Mm -hmm. um, and and that, that's kind of my question. Um, so, if you're open to another question. Yep. So, okay, so you had soybeans last year, you're rotating. So, you used uh, Extendamax, which is dicamba. So, um, and we've used uh, Status with Roundup, but no residual before on corn and soybeans. <coughs> okay. But, you know, my partner says, well, I don't know if I want to use, well, we already used dicamba last year. I don't know if I want to come back with status, which is basically a dicamba product again. And then maybe on your pre, you used uh, mesotrione, coupled with uh, some atrazine, and maybe um, some uh, uh, methachlor as a pre. So what are you going to come back with as a as a post to get your uh, broadleaves, because mesotrione doesn't have much much residual, very short. 
I might punt this one to my advisor <laughs> on that one. So the question is, what are you going to do to prevent going with dicamba after dicamba? Well, dicamba the year before mm -hmm. with your uh, Extendamax. Mm -hmm. And my partner says, well, I don't really know if I want to go back with dicamba in the second application. In the because, second year or in the same year? No, it would be the next year. Because see, as a first application, as a pre, we probably go with mesoprenone, some atrazine, and maybe some uh, mesoprenone, but then we need to come back with something. So there's a little bit of data that exists that suggests that the more important thing than switching, for, we want you to switch as much as possible, but it's more important to include multiple modes of action with each application um, than it is to switch from your year. So rather than going with straight dicamba, we would like to see you, you know, come back with dicamba plus something or follow your dicamba application or something else. Well, in a dicamba, basically you're looking at your status or uh, um, diplex. Mm -hmm. Well, dicamba. Mm -hmm. What's an alternative? No, I think, so she mentioned adding the color port. Use a different move. To the status. You, you mentioned that earlier. So yeah, I had, well, so if, you use, if you use the core in your pre, and then you come back with uh, Zuja, uh, because what I want to get is I want to get the fall pain. And I want to get a residual to help with... If you're deciding the between Zidua and Metolacor, based on what we know about the solubility of those herbicides and what Tyler's data is suggesting, I would recommend you go with your Zidua at planting because it's going to take more water and you're more apt to get more water in the spring and save your Metolacor for later in the season where you're going to be able to get a shower and get that activation without as much... Okay, good, good point. Okay, I think we'll take a break now. Uh, I think, oh, I'm sorry, you uh, got Pretty no, much, I was just going to say, basically we talked about a few different ways you can residual your, reconsider your residual herbicides. So we talked about changing your spray, your sprayer parameters, and really tailoring your residual herbicide selection, specifically group 15s, to your upcoming forecast. Um, thank you. Um, thank you guys for your good conversation.